<laughs> yeah, it was the- well, hello and welcome to Q&A with Pastor Randy, Pastor Kim, and PG. We are glad you joined us with our fancy music, which you guys can't hear, but I can hear. I bet it's it's good. Like, mm-hmm. Not even close, Pastor Kim. Go, uh, what, do you, what do you think it sounds like again? Go to it. <laughs> <laughs> These musical people like to humiliate yeah, us yeah. non-musical people. Yeah. No, yeah, they do. They do. Uh, no, love it. They love it. no. It would just be interesting to hear you try to mimic what you can't hear. So, was it? <laughs> was it? <laughs> that sounded no, like I, a polka. No, no, <laughs> that was. That was definitely a polka. It's. It's like a. I could. Un- I could unplug it. So you could hear it. Here. There we go. Here we go. Oh, yeah, we, we, we hear that one all the time. Yeah, that's your favorite jam. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's pretty good. When yeah. Pastor Randy walks in his good. office, this is what he starts with. Okay, anyway. I'm, I'm right to that rhythm. Uh-huh. I feel like we may have digressed a bit here. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for Q&A. If you have questions, go ahead and stick them in. It is important to mention that this is a very special day. Of yes. the days of the year, this is one of the most special days because yeah. the incredible Faith Great House turned 25 today. And, Yay, and yes, where is she? Yes. she put her on camera. Where and she, yes. she became cognitively Faith? functional. Yes, <laughs> 25. <Okay>. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> she, she was telling us now that she has a can can both rent a car with less fees and has a fully developed brain. Yeah. Yes, it was, yeah. it was cool. You're not going to come on camera. And her you? car insurance will probably go down. Car insurance plummeted. Mm-hmm. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> she's, she's going with a hard path. Well, trust us. She's a lovely young lady that loves the Lord with all her heart. Yes, she and does. We are, but she's noticeably less impulsive now. Yes, she's yes, 25. She's 25, like a switch. It was like yeah. immediately as soon as she turned 25. <laughs> Cognitive uh, yeah. development just changed, changed, changed. engaged completely. Okay, yeah. you're going to get to see the comments. <laughs> I'm, there. I'm, I'm getting there. We were, we were. Uh, uh, there's a lot of falderall going on, so we're yes. weeding out the falderall, and I am launching Facebook so we can see. Why don't you let us know where you're watching from? And of course, everyone that's watching must wish Miss Faith yes. happy birthday, happy Pastor birthday. Kim. While I do that and take a drink of my of my water bottle. If you see Faith, <laughs> give her, <laughs> this is a joke, we used to call it a, a, a Pentecostal handshake, which is where you put a 20 in the palm of your hand oh, and you shake somebody's hand. Pentecostal <laughs> hand. I used to call it a Pentecostal I handshake. like that. <laughs> All right, why don't you tell us what's going on, Pastor Kim? Well, let's see. Big thing, I guess, is come and see Sunday. That's Sunday. Right. Yeah, Two more Sunday. weeks, get those invites out there. Yes. We got a lot more cards Sunday, so grab up some more cards. And we did. We ordered invite, another 5,000 cards because all 5,000 the first week went out. Isn't mm-hmm. that crazy? And it's crazy. On the back of the card is a, a QR QR code. Oh, you can scan. She's signaling. What's up? Oh, it's oh, frozen. Let me, go see, let me go see. The phone looks okay. Pastor Kim, did you turn off your uh, notifications and stuff before you started? I just clicked it on don't do the D&D, perfect. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That's good. And let's see. Well, there we are. And there's people watching. So it, oh. it, we're, we're, okay. See. It appears to be working. Although well, Pastor Randy looks we're not frozen. Looks we're puzzled. Wrong. You look. I, I do. I look frozen. Deep in thought. Okay. Well, now, now I'm. Mo- but you're mobile. not smiling. You got to smile. Well, yeah, smile I'm, I'm not a real smiley guy. You got to tell me something funny. You get it. A- that makes you laugh too. That makes me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure Faith has the same response on her. She's awesome. Uh, a blessing, a blessing. Miss Danny Barber is watching. Faith is amazing, she says. Let her finish. Don't cut her off. Let us know your questions. Faith is amazing. Y'all are so sweet. Thanks, guys. Uh, Ross Miranda. is at the beach. At Myrtle Ooh. Beach. Ooh. Ross. Boogie boarding. Yeah. Boogie boards. So, true story. First vacation I took with Jessica's family. That's from a, a, a group of predominantly ladies. No, no male, even Jamie's, her father's. Father passed away when he was very young, three uh, three years old, and so I was the first like male to court one of his daughters. Jesse's the oldest, and there was not sports, there was not um, uh, activities. Were sur- surrounded sitting and reading books. A really crazy night is they all read would read a different book. <laughs> that was, I mean, it was just <laughs> unbridled. <laughs> went to the beach with them and they're all sitting there you know they all get a book and they're all under yeah. like all these umbrellas sitting <laughs> reading and I'm I'm like like you know it oh. probably took a full 37 seconds until yeah. I'm like okay had to do something. what are we going to do guys <laughs> and they're like 
this is what we do. <laughs> we sit here and like, well, how, how long do we do this for? <laughs> and it was a long time. Okay, so, and then I broke all three of their boogie boards. All three of them. Oh. They were like the styrofoam ones. Right. And I was trying to get over the waves, and apparently they were not made for someone of my, I was only 160 pounds soaking wet at the time, but broke all the Hutzel boogie boards. So, anyways, <laughs> digress. Miss uh, Robin. Okay, I think we should fire in some questions. If you have any other questions, stick them in the chat, and we will respond. Uh, All right, well, looks like let's start with the question we left off last week. It, we didn't get to it, just yes. the one. It was, it's about adultery. Should Christians forgive adultery? It's a complex question, um, so I'm going to have to answer it in pieces. It, it's always appropriate for us to forgive now, in the case of adultery, that doesn't mean that it won't end the marriage. Uh, the person may choose to forgive the person, but still end the marriage, feeling that the trust has been destroyed. Uh, biblically, they're, they're on safe ground there. The person may forgive the adultery and then continue in the marriage. You, you know, mm -hmm. So forgiving any sin is always appropriate for us, but that doesn't mean that you're going to restore the circumstances necessarily. If trust has been broken. Yeah. Well, obviously it would have been if adultery has been committed, but some people can get over that and choose to work through it, and, and some just feel they, they simply can't do that. You know? Trust is easy to break, challenging to rebuild. Yes. Challenging to rebuild. Mm -hmm. Well well done. We'll give you, uh, I'm going to give you an eight and a half on the, that answer. <laughs> okay. Pastor Kim, what do you think? Yeah, I'll go with that. Eight, eight and a half. <laughs> it was shorter. Oh, that's, oh, that's, that's I why I was high. See, that's I, why should, I'm totally I should get a nine then. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. I should give you one. Anyhow. All right, want me to go to the next one? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so someone asks, is there a difference? We talk about the tribulation, and then we talk about the great tribulation. Is there a difference yes, there between a difference? these? Uh, I saw that question. I, I guess technically the term tribulation is not really biblical mm -hmm. um, we take it from Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9 you know the the 77s or the seven cycles of seven anyway 490 year cycle <laughs> <laughs> seven and um, and we take that last seven year cycle as being we we've labeled it the tribulation but technically that's not in the Bible now Jesus did speak about the last three and a half years that he he labels the great tribulation. Mm -hmm. So in Matthew 24, you know, Jesus talks about the beginning of birth pains. Yeah. And this is kind of the lead up. So perhaps we could call that the tribulation, the first three and a half years, you know, that would be fine. But it's the second three and a half years that scripture really points at mostly. Book of Revelation is almost completely focused on the last three and a half years, the, the great tribulation. So, you know, that, do you Do you believe that uh, all Christians will um, go through the entire tribulation, all seven years. No, some will die. Martyrdom, <laughs> right? Do you feel like the, the word that we most commonly use for rapture will take place post seven? Yeah, uh, the Bible is, is so clear on this that it's a puzzle to me, and, and I know that sounds rather arrogant, but it really is. If you just read it with the simple man's eyes, what the Bible clearly says what it does not say, it is it is so clear that uh, Christians will still be on earth through the entire tribulation. Yeah, I mean, um, Matthew 24, verse 29 through 31, where we have Christ returning, it, it says after the tribulation of those days, we have uh, him returning, his angels with him, and the calling up of the mm -hmm. living followers, you know, and those that were already dead receive their resurrection bodies first and then we all unite with him come back with him on planet earth so that's the only chronological reference in the entire yep. bible to the return of christ and it's clearly linked to what we call the rapture the, the full but it's the full I, I was it must have been a clip that i heard from i think it was the message you did on the great deception but it could have just been the revelation and it sounded like i, I guess you would must have been explaining um a version of like amillennialism where we or not amillennialism um, mid-trib rapture I think you were explaining the theology but you I guess you hadn't embraced it because it sounded like you were saying this could be the case uh, but I, 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 I'm not sure I have to no, go back and listen there, there, there was a time where um, <clears throat> I was looking real seriously at the p p possibility that the pre-wrath 
rapture. Okay, that's what it which, was. Which means in the book of Revelation, you know, you have like the seven seals and seven trumpets and then seven bowls of wrath. Um, and I, I mean, there there was some room to think that maybe before the bowls of wrath were poured we, out. But when you really look at what, the, again, the book of Revelation says, not so. The Christians are still on earth when going through the it. last battle, the battle yeah. of Armageddon is about to ensue, the battle that never yeah. happens. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there there's only one clear... Th this is another thing important. Okay, when, when Matthew 24, 4, verses 29 through 31 are describing the return of Christ and the, the catching up or the taking up <laughs> yeah. of Excuse his... Me? Well, well that, that passage is repeated by the Apostle Paul and enlarged upon in 1 Corinthians 15, and then once again in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. So Paul is talking about the rapture passage in light of what Jesus said. He's, he's, just, just, right. he's just repeating. And in 2 Thessalonians, he goes out of his way to, make to show that, that certain things have to occur before the Lord returns. 2 Thessalonians chapter um, 2, he says that there has to be this this falling away, some sort of an unusual apostasy event is going to occur. There has to be the actual revelation of what the one we call the Antichrist, the individual that's going to sit in the Jewish temple or, or on the Jewish mount or, or somewhere in that proximity and declare himself as our God, our creator. So these things clearly are said to have to happen before the return of Christ. And so Paul's elaboration of the rapture, and, and, and what we've done, we've se separated them. Uh, some people teach, well, what Jesus was talking about was for the Jewish people. You know, and that's at the end, that's seven years later, the rapture. They all use what that Paul, voice. What, they do, they do, <laughs> every <laughs> one of them. <laughs> they say they do what, not sound intelligent <laughs> the way you're saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but that, what, what they will teach is that what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 is something that occurs seven years before. Oh, it's the secret whisping away of the church, you know, and, and it's just nonsense. He, he's, Paul is just repeating what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He's adding a couple uh, components to it that clarifies it a bit. But, but that, for example, what Paul clarifies is that the dead in Christ will get their resurrection bodies first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught, caught up, up together. Yeah. yeah. So that he, he's not saying anything different than what Jesus says in Matthew 24 through 29. And that's the only place it says specifically, after the tribulations so, of those days. So what after. is what is the what are the the hallmark passages that that a pre-trib rapture uh, theologian would use? Because there's a, I mean there's a lot of them. Well, I feel like the, it is the it is the more popular clearly and and more common uh, rapture perspective than than post-trib. It is, and let me explain why. But but it was not. It is, but was not. Okay, post trib. No, I, I knew that. Yeah. Post trib was held from the earliest yeah. days of the church up until um, the 19th century. Okay, in the 19th century in England, uh, there were uh, there were a few things happening. You had a group called the Plymouth Brethren that were good Bible students. There was also some charismatic meetings happening. There's there's a story about a lady at a charismatic meeting that got, had a vision that the church would be raptured away before the tribulation. The uh, who is that? I think her name was Mary McDonald. Um, so okay. What comes to mind? And uh, at, at any rate, um, two two scholars. I mean, reasonably reasonable scholars. The Plymouth Brethren scholars, uh, Trigellus and can't think of the other dude's name right now. Anyway. I'm surprised you came up with True Jealous. Uh, they, they take this teaching, supposedly, as the way it happened, and they get interested in it. And then a guy from the United States, a lawyer named Silas Schofield, Schofield he right. goes across to England. A lot of revivals going on. This is D.L. DL Moody's time yep. and all like that. And um, he <laughs> takes this teaching, <clears throat> and he takes it very seriously and systematizes it, comes back to the United States, and we, we have the study Bible he, he brings into existence called the Schofield Reference Bible. Mm -hmm. It's the very first reference that teaches this position of a, a secret rapture of the church. So mind you, the first 1900 years of Christianity, no one, no, 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 they have dug deeply and they try to find a reference in this church father and that church father. It's 
it's really it's not obscure. There. But but there's yeah. but there's I mean, there are passages, right? I mean, one of the well, I, and I'll get to that. But but it's important to know the history that for 1900 years this teaching didn't exist. Right. You're right. It is the most popular posi- position today because Schofield takes it, puts it in his reference Bible. Schofield has a good friend named Lewis Berry Chafer. Lewis Berry Chafer founds Dallas Theological Seminary. He embraces this teaching. Dallas Theological Seminary promotes it, and they become the most influential theological seminary, and still to this day are in this country. So that's why it has become so popular today. Christians don't don't know any better. They they, your first time you hear something, say, oh, the church is going to be raptured before the tribulation. Yay. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay, that's what happened to me too. And then I had a very peculiar guy in a church I was in, <coughs> named Dave Dooley. Um, <laughs> who one day as we were leaving an evening service at Little Bitty Bethel Bible Church, he says, hey, Randy, he says, and out of the blue, and this was the kind of guy Dooley was, he says, hey, Randy, the church is going to be raptured for the tribulation, right? I said, Dave, yeah, come, come on, on, man, you know that. He says, well, where does it say that? And he walked away. Mm-hmm. And that guy sent me on a study for myself um, of all the past. How long ago was this? Oh, my goodness. I was 25, 26 so that's a long time ago. <laughs> Four or five years ago. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's a long time. So you had not been in ministry for very long at that point, maybe five years? Well, I, I, had not, I wasn't in ministry at all. I, was, I, I, I got saved when I was 23. This was about my second or third year of being a Christian. So you were just attending Bethel? Yeah, just attending Bethel. I was already working with the youth, teaching Sunday school class. had a youth, youth group I met with during the week that, that I just that kind of started there. <laughs> so... Um, so the point being, okay, what are the major passages? That was your question. Well, I've actually already given them. <laughs> there, there, there's only two. Well, they'll look at Matthew, but they don't like to because they say, that's Jewish ground. <laughs> and they do that voice when they, when they go to Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, Hi, it's 1 Corinthians 15, and it's 1 Thessalonians 4. Sorry, say it again. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses yeah. 50 through 52, yeah. and 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. These are the two, what they would call, major rapture passages. There, frankly, are no other. Okay, now, now they'll try to, you know, support it with other verses. They'll say, well, why would Jesus want his body to suffer, you know? Why right. would he want his bride to suffer, you know, all these kinds of things. Well, but, uh, but, you know, the whole New Testament talks about the acceptance of tribulation as one of God's dynamic means of purifying our souls, catalyzing development. And being privileged and, to suffer as Jesus suffered. Exactly. Right? And, and yeah. presenting a compelling witness because people see, wow, these people are so committed to this truth that they will undergo hardships and deny themselves um, because this has gripped their heart. This mm-hmm. is authentic to them. So there's all kinds of reasons why suffering is allowed by God for his own people. Um, you know, all you got to do is look at the Apostle Paul's list. And right. It's almost comedic. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 30, uh, he had only been a follower of Christ for 20 years. He gets another approximately 12 years to go after that. But the list of sufferings that he had compiled in just 20 years were, were just shocking. But he was God's number one servant on the planet. So, you know, the notion that we are to be whisked away from all difficulties. And, and, and by the way, getting eaten by a lion in the arena is great tribulation. Yeah. <laughs> a lion's jaws collapsing on your skull, I think, is, is, it qualifies for doesn't, great tribulation. It doesn't seem. <laughs> I'd rather go in a, a sub-implosion than in, than in, the, in that way. So the point is, is Christians have always suffered uh, for, for their unity, their loyalty to Christ. The Great Tribulation is called great because there's going to be the involvement of um, astronomical upheaval, tectonic upheaval, uh, wars, so, yeah, social um, and evil plagues. I mean, I mean, it's all these things con- converging, you, you know, at, at one point, as well as um, the appearance of um, the Antichrist and his forces and, and all these kinds of things. So you said, you said 1 Corinthians 15, 15? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 through 52. It's a very scant passage. It's, it's really just emphasizing the fact that, you know, we that who are alive and remain will be in a twinkling of an eye, you know, at the last trumpet. Yeah, but that's uh, nothing Notice again, about... it's the last trumpet. That's interesting, too. Uh, and, and, uh, and then in 
But that, but that doesn't say anything about a pre-trib rapture. I, I declare, no, brothers and sisters, doesn't. the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor is perishable inherit imperishable. Listen, I tell you the mystery: we will not sleep, but we will be changed. Okay, maybe yes. that's what they're saying. I don't know. In a well, flash, and Higgin and I, yeah. last trump, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead, and cri- the <laughs> dead will raise imperishable, and we will be changed. No, the the the. You have to understand, the pre-tribulational rapture is entirely, and, and, I, and I hate to be obnoxious, um, I, I do it with ease, however, but, I, <laughs> but it is entirely built on supposition. Okay. And the supposition is that God's got a plan for the Jews and a plan for the Gentiles and a plan for the church of Christ. And since we are his body, we are his bride, we are not uh, going to be allowed to undergo Wrath. Well, wrath, in the passage that it's taken from in First Thessalonians, it's really just talking about final wrath, the, you know, being, you know, disconnected for eternity from, from God. It's not. It's not talking about the wrath of sufferings or tribulation that have been the the lot of God's people throughout all generations. So yeah, it's just those passages, and then the rest is is supposition. Christ would not allow his bride, his body to undergo sufferings, which is just not biblical. It's, it's not supported. Seems, seems counter to what we see in most of Scripture. Well, we're told in Scripture to expect tribulation. The in new, this life new, you will new, face yeah, it. Yeah, in the New Testament it's redundant. It's kind of like beating it into our heads. Don't be surprised. For, for Peter 5, you know, the, the devil is looking to, for Peter 5, 8, 9, 10, the devil's looking who he can devour. It right. says, but it says, but but you look at your brothers are undergoing the same sufferings as you, and after you have suffered a while, God Himself will restore you, and you know develop you and all this kind of stuff. So the suffering component is is supposed to be normative. Right. It's just that we've brought, been brought up in a time in human history where suffering for Americans is extremely rare. You yeah. know, yeah. Other than yeah. you know the mental emotional. Uh, you know, type of thing. Which so in, in persecution, generally, yeah, we we don't we we've heard of it. There's no concept. <laughs> no. Somebody made fun of me at school because I said I'm a Christian. That's yeah. persecution. Oh, oh, it hurt my feelings because they right. made fun of me. They, you soft. But I, that is changing. Okay. Yeah. Now, mm-hmm. were we to be more familiar with what's happening in places like India, in places like North Korea, oh, yeah. you know, in any Islamic nation, and some. In particular, that are that are very extreme, we would realize Christians are suffering, and, and oh, yeah. they're they're being physically attacked and even killed. Nigeria, thousands of Christians have been yeah. murdered in Nigeria, just in the past couple of years, simply because they're Christians. Right. So suffering, on the worst level, it is occurring, but it's foreign to us here in this yeah. country. But that is changing, because now we are being looked upon. Uh, as domestic terrorists, just because of conservative views of family, mm-hmm. you can be tagged as a cons- uh, you know uh, yeah. domestic terrorist. And so, when hate speech starts becoming uh, a crime globally, we will experience persecution. And, and in yeah. my opinion, that that is on its way. Mm-hmm. And what what they can categorize uh, any what, anything. That doesn't fit the political agenda could be categorized as hate speech. This is what communist countries did, and they marched off people by the millions into the re-education camps, as they called them. And of course, most of them were never heard of again. They were re-educated to death in most cases. <laughs> well, I'll close this topic with this. All right, Pastor Kim, because I can tell she wants to get us back on track. Uh, we, we, we. <laughs> Actually, that sounded loud. No, that's not bad. A little thump. Uh, I was educated at a uh, mainstream denominational Pentecostal school, and the school that I went to taught pre-trib rapture. But I'm going to try to be vague on purpose. He's no longer there, so it doesn't matter. But he he was the doctor who he was a doctor was a a major leader within the school. I think he oversaw the New Testament. New Testament think, theology, theological yes. stuff. Well, he definitely right? taught New Testament theology, but I think he was actually over the department. And he he was very very influential in my life. Taught my taught Greek and Hebrew, uh, Hebrew and Latin, all three languages. And my brother took more courses with him. But anyways, he ended up a huge part of our lives. And I remember at one point talking with him about before I ever met you, talking to him about rapture. And of course, he is 
supposed to be towing this denominational line. denominational line, and he said, he wrote it. By the way, I should have said he, he wrote his dissertation on Revelation, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, all I can all I can do is tell you the truth. Like all I can do is be, is be me, and I find it very hard to arrive at a pre-trib rapture rapture using scripture. I just can't get there. Uh, I I can't, and which I mean. And that was my, I mean, I was locked in as a young Christian to um, the pre-trib system and dispensational theology and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, but when I started looking at the scripture with the eyes of a, a, a yielded, teachable, everyday man, um, it just wasn't there. It's, yeah. it's, I just, I, I wanted it to be there. Man, I don't want to, I don't want to. Go through any unnecessary suffering. I don't have to. I'm an American to the core. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he. I remember this. This prof started class the first New Testament day, reading all of these verses that are. It's like the he had created this most commonly misinterpreted verses, and you know that you hear used in sermons, and they're used so out of context oh, yeah. consistently. Yeah. And I think there was like twenty of them, and he was just like, "What does this mean?" You know. <laughs> overly zealous uh, freshman or I guess it would have been sophomore year Bible college students are like that means this and he is like no let's read that in scripture and just and by like the third time nobody, nobody would raise nobody. Nobody. <laughs> but I was like man I like this guy like, if he couldn't find it in scripture he would not create a, th a theology based on it so I, I loved him and I don't even care He's you're the man if you're watching I don't think he is but He's awesome. Mm -hmm. Moved to Regent and um, is doing a bunch down there at Regent University. So. Anyways, Pastor Kim, I think there was more than one question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm like, how did we get into the whole pre-trib rapture? From adultery? I, like, I don't think it matters. I don't uh, think it matters if you, if believe, you in believe in the rapture. No, I, I want to, because this has been asked me a few times. I want to clarify something. I absolutely believe in the rapture because the rapture is just talking about living believers will be in the twinkling of an eye given their resurrection bodies when Christ returns. Yeah. It is the timing of the rapture that I differ. Um, mm. I fall in line with what Christians believed for the first 1900 years of Christianity, that the rapture does not happen until Christ returns, which is, by Jesus' own words, after the tribulation. Mm -hmm. So I believe in the rapture, it's just the timing of it. Others teach that it's going to occur secretly seven years before the, or, yeah. or, or before the tribulation yeah. starts, which is seven years before the return of Christ in their system of thinking. So, so it's, it's, that's the difference. It's yeah. the timing element. I think she's just, she's, that was, uh, my, my pop would say that sometimes when he would get in conversations about pre-trib, post-trib, post -trib, my dad would be like, hey, here's the deal. I plan to be there. That's what oh, she's, she's oh, just I joking. I see what Nadine is saying. She's just saying. Um, well, her, she's, she's actually being wise. She's saying, I'm going to be ready for the tribulation in case the rapture doesn't happen before the tribulation. There's nothing wrong with that position. In fact, that's yeah. what I've, I've wanted people to yeah. at least embrace through all my 31 years uh, of this church. You can differ. You can still believe in the pre-tribulation rapture if you choose to, but I hope you'll at least listen enough that you might prepare yourself a little bit in case you're wrong. I mean, here's the deal. Like, like if, if you're wrong... You just go up early and don't have to deal with yes, it. Yes, yes. If they're wrong, <laughs> my my point exactly. It's <laughs> exactly. All and, right, and and I think we just you know we're wiser to be prepared. Okay, we can go on. Okay. She's I'm just, I'm just kind of like, how did we get into a big rap? Like, we talk hey, about this a lot, so why are we talking about it again when we didn't even have a question And, about and it? actually, it's one, so our time is up. Thank you so much for joining us for Q&A. No! <laughs> this woman asked a question, and we're going to answer we it. We will answer it. <laughs> she says. With brevity and clarity. Sheet. My sister feels <laughs> she is unworthy of God's love, and this oh. keeps her from taking a step toward baptism. Mm. How can I minister to her so that she can believe that Christ died for us, the unworthy? Yeah, I mean, honestly, all, all you can do is keep telling her that and showing her the scriptures. You know, that, uh, like Romans 5, 8, when we were still sinners, yeah. Christ died for, for us. And so... Uh, other than showing her in the scripture and reaffirming it that none of us are, are worthy. That's no. why we need a, a savior. We need to be rescued from sin. 
we need God's forgiveness. He he offers it to us if we'll be willing to just trust him. So that's all you can do. A, a, a lot of scarring occurs in our lives that make trusting grace very difficult. And, and I, I know this by experience. And so you do go through this mental battle because you may feel um, in your own skin, as it were, uncomfortable with with yourself and, and, and unworthy of forgiveness or anything. And yet you've got to come back to, am I going to trust myself or am I going to trust Christ? Am I going to trust Scripture? And that's the wonderful thing that God is better than, than you know, even the kindest human. And mm -hmm. he does want us to embrace grace so that he can bring, in other words, he wants to rescue us. He wants to heal us. He, he lavishes us with forgiveness so that we can then be cleansed. We can be um, restored and all, all yeah. these things. So none of us, none of us are prepared. None of us are worthy if she could convince her of that. But having said that, due to emotional scarring that occurs in life, it's really, really hard to get that through to some people. It really yeah. is. You know? Was that hard? I mean, you, you've shared that you've had a, a checkered past. Yeah. Is that safe to say? Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like you've shared that it was challenging for you at times. That it almost brings you to tears and, and it's thinking. Still, it's still challenging. I, he, here's the irony, and, and I hope this doesn't unsettle certain people. When, when I first became a Christian, God's grace was very, very easy for me to embrace and accept and feel completely comfortable in. It was as I started to understand God intends us to grow and as his light start, started to come on more and more areas of my life, um, and I saw how deficient I was, I saw how undone uh, I was, and as the decades have come and gone, and his light comes on me, and I still see areas of tremendous deficiency, and, and I look back at regret in, in times when I've stumbled, when I've been rebellious, when I've been stupid, that stuff haunts me, man. That, that mm. stuff torments me. And, and I struggle with God's grace, which is ironic. Here I am, a Christian leader. I can very confidently uh, tell others of the certainty of God's grace. But I have to fight this thing in my own soul because I very easily just don't feel worthy to, to even lift my eyes sometimes. So that's that's because of my brokenness, though. I mean, you know, a lot of it has to do, I'm sure, with, you know, being brought up the way I was brought up and being very broken and insecure. And, and, and those things have been greatly helped by my decades with the Lord, but they're still there. And so I, I have to kind of, it, it's kind of my besetting sin tendency. It's kind of the, the area that I know I've got to, I gotta watch. I have to fight through. It's it's easier for me to be a servant of God than to be a son of God. I don't feel comfortable with being God's child. I, I but can that's be what he comfortable. Calls us to. That's what He makes it clear. We are. We are. Yeah. And, and I know these things. But I'm trying to say psychologically, yeah, I, ha I have to fight through this stuff uh, because of, again, not because of it's not clear in God's word. It's because of my own personal, yeah, psychological, emotional brokenness that is still not quite, you know, healed. So. It's challenging. Yeah. I, I think I'm, I'm not I'm not a parent. I don't have children. But sometimes I think that God gave us these families to help us understand these. Because because if you Absolutely. think as a parent how you will love your child no matter what mm -hmm. they do, mm -hmm. and that when you can experience that kind of love, it gives just this tiny little picture of God's right. love for like His ability to love us through our mess. Absolutely. You know? yeah. And I think sometimes we, we stop and think of those well, kinds of examples yeah, and, can help us. And I have to do that. Yeah. I, I, like I say, I, I know that God's grace is mm -hmm. sure. I know it's clear. I can articulate affirm it. other people yep. articulate it. Yeah. But as an emotional being, right. there are just times, man, that all this darkness comes over me. And every every evil thing well maybe not every but a lot of things and a lot of failures they just come back and they're they're front and center they're mm -hmm. they're like that's who i am now even though i know no it's not who i am now but it's just this battle that i have to fight you know yeah. Yeah. well and you see it the the reference to parents even though you might not, might not have children of your own we see from time to time where a parent will even like not want to see the shortcomings in your in, <laughs> in, their, in their kids it's to a fault yeah, they'll, they'll right. want to yeah. and i mean in some ways not that's the way christ is, was with us i mean 
the, yeah. we have the accuser of the brethren, and then it's he's making yeah. intercession. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I'll be interested to hear when you know the lights are all mm-hmm. turned on how much I played along with the accuser of the mm. brethren. Yeah, because I think I've perhaps helped him to just work me over good sometimes. Mm. But but I have learned something, and I hope this is not going to mislead somebody else. When I go through these things, they are always very humbling. I mean, extraordinarily humbling. And I suspect somewhere I need that. I I think that I'm kind of a hard-headed sort who who could easily get full of himself. And and maybe this is is God's grace. and, and, And so I know that I have to fight them, but I also know that there's a a beneficial component, at least for me, not necessarily for anybody else, but at least for me, because they are very humbling. I mean, you uh, you can't even flirt with pride. <laughs> <laughs> All right, pa- keep, we have one more, right, Pastor Kim? Well, I want to say hi to Bucky. Bucky's Bucky. Hey, Bucky. Hey. He's on there. He's home from the hospital and all. Oh, Still wonderful. Brady. He catch says, catch you all. Of course, my favorite. My sister-in-law. <laughs> She's awesome. <laughs> Catch you off course, my favorite. I think I think maybe it's a typo or something in there. If it's yeah. an auto check. Yeah. Anyhow, like hi, Bucky. Um, obviously, people very very much appreciate your vulnerability, both now yeah. and on Sunday mornings. We won't tell anybody, but the yogurt has a heart. Yogurt. Yeah, you gotta you gotta really dig deep. You know? No, get some of those no, mining no, tools. You no. know, uh, I actually worked for Pastor Randy for, I guess, four months before we were able to spend uh, chunks of time together in person. In person yeah. And obviously, yeah, that was so, weird. You know, it's weird. Um, but when we were we're able to sit down and talk. You have all sorts of thought processes on who somebody is and even hearing, learning the narrative of somebody from other people. But I, you, are, you are very humble. You are very tender. Your, your, um, your sincerity is there. You're, there. There's not guile in you, like a, in, in, your, in your makeup. Um, that, that is not something that you, you, you function in in your manipulation. Uh, anyways. I, well, I, I appreciate it. You're, you're very kind, and, uh, and it's... It's very much appreciated. Yeah. yeah, he's a good egg. A little cracked. <laughs> well, the cracked part is <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, the, the last one, or should we say this for next time? I had another thought, too. Another okay. question for next week. Okay. We can write it down. Is what was, what was your first couple experiences with uh, uh, someone of faith? Your first uh, uh, introductions to Christianity, religion. Um, yeah, don't answer now because I, mean, okay. I think mm-hmm. we should... Go yep. go with go with that as a question for next week. And you want to save the stay in the spirit point for next week too, because it is yeah. Because that one was that was faith. We're just you know, uh, but there was the one that um, about reading faults and minds. Yeah, let's, I think let's, it let's, came let's, in. Let's hit it next week. Okay. We've actually answered okay. it before, and we're forty yeah. minutes now. Yeah. Okay, so we, we can say that one too. But it's mainly it last time just flies by. It does. When, my how time flies when one is having fun with mm-hmm. friends. But that that's so. I think that's the truth. It is absolutely. This <laughs> this goes this goes fast. So all right, we love you, um, Pastor Randy. Alluded to it earlier as we were talking, undone or undone. Mm. See what we did there. That, yeah. yeah, he's fancy, mm-hmm. and, which and, and which actually is hilarious that some of the graphics and stuff were made, and from time to time, Pastor Randy will write a write a, a message topic, and he'll put, "I'm either gonna like your your title is almost and for me is one of the last things that I put on a message because right. you want to get your whole head around it, and sometimes you want to be true to Scripture, and so you will run down a path, think God is leading you one direction, and realize, no, I'm actually going to end up over here. So if you Put a title in your head. The title will almost link you to something and force you. And you don't want to do that. You right. want to try to be open. So, initially, when we received the title, we weren't sure. At least I wasn't sure. It sounds like Pastor Kim wasn't. Mm-mm. It was U N D O N as one word, D O N E as right. one word, yep. or un dash done. Right. And so we were sure. We thought he was saying, "I'm either going to use this as the title, <laughs> or this is the title," which we have had before, yeah. where it's oh, yeah. like. Absolutely. deceptions of this yeah. or destructions of this. And I'm not right. sure which we're going to run with. Um, but it, as we got closer, like the bumper was done, some of the graphics had yeah. been done, and we realized 
Give, give us the little push. It, it was not a one or the other. It is no. no it, it's, a it, it, it's the notion that we we have these experiences where we are in God's light and we see things about ourselves that are alarming and uncomfortable, and we feel undone, like Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet. Yeah. But just like Isaiah the prophet, when we are humble and we want God and we want His cleansing in those moments. Well, that's when we get the affirmation, he's not done with us. So undone, meaning that... I'm undone. <laughs> what's, what's going on? Uh, you, you okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something in your throat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <if so>. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, God's not done with us yet. Yeah. He is more, he's using us, this is part of his plan, and he's going to use... It. And people in powerful ways, whether they feel like they're worthy of it or not, or whether they feel like they're qualified, God can use us. So I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't know, God is doing something incredible at FCF Church. Amen. And um, we actually have some exciting things to share with Pastor Randy and Pastor Kim about some facility. I gave Pastor Kim a little taste oh, yesterday yeah, about another yeah, piece, yeah. architectural yes. designs oh, for uh, wow. building and kind of... Yeah options for moving forward because we're having some some seating issues come to second service if you don't mind that would help yeah. us <laughs> so, <laughs> but hey, well, yes go ahead. i'm interrupting but hmm. tuesday next tuesday the 19th is um bible institute standing firm in times of deception yes want to make sure we mention that yes one. Um, Tuesday is it six thirty? Six thirty. Six thirty. We're trying to keep everything six thirty, so everybody knows if it's an evening thing, it's, it's six thirty. That's yeah. what we do. Six thirty. It's good. It it I like it. I like yeah. it. All right, join us Sunday nine fifteen eleven fifteen. The second uh, piece of the series, second message in the series, is yeah. undone or undone, and the title is unfiltered, Un unfiltered speech. speech. Unfiltered yeah. speech. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> No? Mm. Pastor Kim is going to bring the word on Sunday. Ooh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Planned and, it. And, and there was a reason. She has this, this Problem with history. her mouth. Uh, no. Yes. Like unfiltered oh, oh, speech. No. <laughs> she walks in my office. So they're going to make me. Swears. And we yeah. think if she studies enough, that's, God will uh, turn it. that heart. Me. That's it. <laughs> She'll have an Isaiah moment. And <laughs> Nicole comes and cleanses her lips. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yep, we, we've been tempted to bring that coal from the altar a time or two. Wow, we have, we have been, I mean, around <laughs> the, the, the game. All right, so thank you for joining us. 9-15, 11-15, this is going to be a great time. And I like to kind of end by playing the fancy music that Pastor Randy loves so much. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start the music, and it's going to be awesome. We will see you. Come to the 11-15 service. Love you, Bye-bye.